Hello, this is David Greenspan, and in this series I'm going to talk about the pathology and complications of twin gestation. And twinning is a fascinating part of biology. And you look at it and you see two human beings growing in the same uterine cavity and growing up to become two distinct individuals. And it's a very unique and somewhat rare but not unusual occurrence. And it almost challenges our regular suppositions and sort of the regular progression of, of life. And it causes us to reflect on individualism and self versus non-self, where I begin and where you end, and the self versus the other and the self versus the non-self. And it also sheds light on the biology of development. And a certain type of twinning called monozygotic twinning, which we'll touch on, is v very unique and distinctive to humans and only very few other animals within the animal kingdom. The importance of twinning and its fascination is underscored by references to twinning in history and mythology and human lore. And one reference is the Greek myth of Castor and Pollux. And Castor and Pollux were said to be two twins. However, one of the things that shows up a lot in the mythology is that there was an asymmetry between the two twins. In that one of the twins, and it's not really clear which, was immortal, and the other twin was mortal. And you could ask, how is that possible? How could one twin be mortal and the other twin be immortal? And the answer given by the myth is that they had two separate fathers. So the mother's name was Leda and the father of one of them was Zeus, and the other father of the other of them was Tyndarius. And so Tyndarius was a mortal. He was actually the husband of Leda. And Zeus is, of course, immortal. He's a god. And therefore, Castor and Pollux were asymmetric. One was mortal and the other was immortal. And it's interesting because a lot of artistic renditions of Castor and Pollux show them hatching from eggs. So it shows the fascination of early man with the genesis of twins and in fact they're often depicted with skull caps on their head that are interpreted as vestiges from the eggs from which they hatched. Of course other references to twins in literature include Romulus and Remus and then there's also the Germanic literature or the Germanic notion of the doppelganger which is you know the presence whose somewhat like me, but not quite me, who wanders about the world and who I'll never meet. So sort of like my counterpart. And then, you know, the notion of the evil twin. And then there's a biblical reference to Jacob and Esau. And in that legend, or in that story, what really stands out is that they were both sort of vying for the blessings of the father Isaac. And in the end, Esau sold it to Jacob for a bowl of lentils. And so Jacob was given the superior blessing. And the language used to, to, to give, that Isaac used to give the blessing was more poetic for Jacob than for Esau. And he was promised to become the heir to the dews of the heaven and the fats of the land. So... So the greatest abundance of, of the natural world was given to Jacob. And the reader is struck by the asymmetry. By the asymmetry. So from a biological perspective, when we talk about twinning, biologically, twinning can really occur in two main ways. So twinning can occur in that the ovary could, normally the human ovary ovulates only one egg per, per cycle per month. But there could be sort of a rare event where the female ovary ovulates two eggs in one cycle. And it could so happen that each egg gets fertilized by a sperm. And then, if that were to happen, each, each conceptus would give rise to an entirely different individual, an entirely different fetus and placenta. So, this scenario where there's two
two acts of fertilization, two separate fertilizations, that's called dizygous twinning because there's two zygotes, two completely different zygotes. And the other thing is to note is that no sperms are exactly identical because of the way meiosis works and no two eggs are. So these two twins are genetically non-identical. In fact, they're no more identical than singletons. They're first degree relatives. So this, once again, is dizygous twinning. The biological predisposition for dizygous twinning relates to things that make a woman predisposed to ovulate twice in a given cycle. So it's found to correlate with race and ethnicity and geography and also with blood levels of FSH and LH, which are hormones that prepare the ovary for ovulation. So blood levels of FSH and LH, and the other thing that we know is that fertility meds. Fertility meds increase dizygous twinning. The other type of twinning is monozygous twinning. Monozygous twinning results from a single act of fertilization. So a single sperm fertilizes a single egg, which then gives rise to a zygote and an embryo. At this stage, you could call it a blastocyst. But at some st stage, maybe at this stage, maybe at this stage, maybe at this stage, it splits. It splits. And the splitting gives rise to two separate twins, to two separate individuals. And that's called a monozygous twin. And the role of the pathologist would be to try to, de one of the roles of the pathologist is to try to determine what the biology of the twinning is. Now, I should have mentioned that monozygous twins, because they arise from a single act of fertilization, it's a single fertilization, they are by definition clonal, so they are genetically similar, not entirely, um, not entirely identical, but genetically very similar, and they're not entirely ad identical because, as we know, genetics could be quite complicated, and there's also epigenetic factors, but they're by and large clonal. They come from the same clone, so they come from the exact same sperm and same egg. Now, the pathologist doesn't have access, or the pathologist isn't really the molecular biologist. There are people who assess the molecular biology, and there is, of course, molecular pathology. But classical pathology is confined to looking at the placenta. And the placenta cannot tell you zygosity. Zygosity, in order to de de determine if two twins are dizygous or monozygous, in other words, if they arose from two fertilizations or one fertilization, you would really need genetic testing. Of course, one thing is that if you have a boy and a girl, it usually, unless there is you know, a genetic event that happens after the splitting, which is quite uncommon, the vast, vast, vast majority of time, if it's a boy and a girl, then it'll have to be dizygous. Whereas, if it's a boy and a boy, or a girl and a girl, the twin could either be dizygous or monozygous. Now, the pathologist doesn't have access, usually, to the genetic studies, and so won't be able to do the genetic studies. But what the pathologist looks at is the placenta. And so the pathologist looks at the nature of the placenta and how the placenta are divided, and then tries to make predictions about the zygosity. And that will be the topic of our next installment.